All right, this is Baby Real Analysis, video 12, and I'm continuing where we left off from video 11, uh, proving some of those limit laws. And in this video, we're focused on just proving the um, product one, where the sequence AN times BN converges to A times B, assuming that AN converges to A and BN converges to B. Before we prove that, I'm gonna make a note of the following. First thing is a sequence is bounded if and only if the absolute value of the terms a n is less than or equal to m, capital M, um, and that's for all, for all little, for all um, n, and that's if and only if. So we have negative m less than or equal to a n less than or equal to m. That's just the definition of absolute value. The second thing is is uh, called convergence of a sequence implies the sequence is bounded. So if a n converges to a, then the sequence a n is bounded. So we're going to first go over the proof for this. And then after we do that proof, then we'll go into the proof of the um, product of A and B and convert us to A times B. All right, so this one um, packs a lot in when I'm for the convergence implies boundedness. So for the strategy, we know uh, we're assuming A and converges to A and by definition of convergence, that means for all epsilon greater than, greater than zero, there exists a capital N such that for all little n bigger than capital N, the absolute value of A and minus A is less than epsilon. All right, so that's true for every epsilon. And so to make things a little bit easier, I'm gonna pick epsilon to be one. So then we have the absolute value of A and minus A to be less than one. And that's if and only if negative one is less than A and minus A less than one. And we add a to everything. So we get a minus one less than a n less than a plus one. Now, what does this mean? So we have a minus one and a plus one. They serve as uh, bounds for a n. But that's for the particular a n values where n is bigger or, or little n is bigger than capital N. So this only, this serves as boundaries just for some particular value, values A and from the sequence. Okay, so what we're trying to show is that the absolute value A and is less than or equal to some value M for every single N. But certainly for all the little, for the indices, little N bigger than capital N, we have the absolute value of A and minus A is less than one which means all the terms a n subscript little n are bounded between a minus one and a plus one. And the question is, what about the terms that come before this cutoff point? So to visualize, here's what I drew. So the green values are all the a n's where for little n bigger than capital N, they're bounded between a minus one and a plus one. And so that's our sort of our confidence region that I've been kind of talking about. So we're, we're fine with all the, for all the green dots. So these were good. We, we know what to do for these. Now the question is, what, what do you do with the terms that come before these uh, green terms? And that's what I labeled as uh, in the color purple. So all the terms that come before a n plus one is a one through a n. We call that for the sequence. The sequence will be listed like a one, a two, a three dot 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 and then you get to a capital N, then a capital N plus one, capital N plus two, and so forth. So all of these 
terms are where we have indices little n bigger than capital N. And all the stuff that comes before that are the indices where n is little n is less than or equal to capital N. So we know for all these terms, you know, these are bounded between a minus one and a plus one. Because we just used our definition of convergence. Now the question is, what about the terms that come before these? And that's where I drew them in purple. So since there's, um, so we have A1 through A capital N, that means there are a finite amount of terms. Since there's a finite, finite amount of terms, that means one of them is going to be the largest and one of them is going to be the smallest. Out of that finitely many terms, I labeled AI as the largest term. And then I labeled the smallest term AJ. So based on this picture, we have AI being the largest value is the upper bound for the entire sequence. And then AJ is the, lar is the smallest value for the entire sequence, so I labeled L for lower bound. All right, it's not necessarily true that AI is going to be bigger than A plus one, though. So that's the key point. It's not necessarily true that the largest term from the finitely many terms, which I'm calling AI, is larger than the upper bound for the indices with n bigger than capital N. So that those are bounded between A minus one and A plus one. So it's not necessarily true that this AI value is larger than A plus one. And it's similar for the, which I'm labeling AJ being smaller than A minus one. It's true for the picture I drew. And that's just because of the picture I drew to visualize. So for the picture, it is true that this, this term is the largest, larger than our bound A plus one, where A plus one is an upper bound for the green terms, the green dots. And those green dots again are the ANs for which the index little n is bigger than capital N. So again, that's based on our picture, how I drew it, that that happens to be that this largest term AI, which comes from the finitely many terms, is larger than the upper bound A plus one for these green terms. Similar for this AJ value. The AJ value, I based on how I drew it, it is, smaller than the A minus one bound, but it does not have to be. All right, so that's a key distinction. And because of that, I need to pick an upper bound U to equal the max of this larger value of between AI and A plus one. And then I'm going to pick a lower bound 
L to be the minimum of this AJ value and A minus one, whichever one is smaller between the two. And that way I'm guaranteed to have an upper bound for all of the values in this sequence, and I'm guaranteed to have a lower bound for all the values in the sequence. Okay, so right here I kind of just wrote out some key points. So for all little n bigger than capital N, all of these a n's are like a n plus one, a n plus two, dot, dot, dot. It's bounded above by a plus one, bounded below by a minus one. All the terms that come before this particular index n are the terms a one, a two, dot, 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 to a capital N. So of the form a subscript k, where k is less than or equal to capital N. Now these are bounded above by, these finite unit terms are bounded above by AI, because that's the largest one out of that finite unit terms. It's bounded below by AJ, because that's the smallest one out of the finitely many terms. And again, it might be the case that A plus one is larger than AI. Also, it might be the case that A minus one is smaller than AJ. Therefore, the larger of AI and A plus one is gonna be an upper bound for all of the terms in the sequence AN. Similarly, smaller of AJ and A minus one is gonna be a lower bound. And so whichever one is the largest between these two, I'm calling that going to be, um, it's going to be U for upper bound. And then whichever one's the smallest between these two, I'm calling that L for lower bound. All right, so that's the idea, is I have to handle the cases in which you have the terms that come before this index little n, and the, in, and the terms that come after this particular index capital N. So here's the proof. The proof, um, assume that the sequence AN converges to A. We must show that AN, the sequence AN is bounded. In other words, we must show that the absolute value of the, the terms AN is less than or equal to capital N for all natural numbers N and M is greater than zero. Because the sequence AN converges to A, then we know for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N, so that for all little n bigger than capital N, we have the absolute value of A N minus A to be less than epsilon. So to make things easier, pick epsilon to be one. Really, it's just because I didn't want to have to keep writing the symbol epsilon. So anywhere that you see one, you can put the symbol epsilon. So there exists some capital N, so that for all little n bigger than capital N, we have the absolute value of a n minus a less than one. And that's if and only if negative one is less than a n minus a less than one. And, and that's if and only if you have a minus one less than a n less than a plus one. So at this point, we know all the terms with n to c little n bigger than capital N are bounded between a minus one and a plus one. It is not necessarily true that the terms with the indices n less than or equal to capital N are also bounded by uh, these same bounds, a minus one and a plus one. So, but we know that for a1, a2, dot, 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 to a capital N, there's a finite amount of terms. So one of these is gonna be the largest. Say it's term AI. Likewise, one of the finitely many terms is the smallest. Say it's term AJ. Now we don't necessarily know if AI is larger than A plus one, or if AJ is smaller than A minus one. In order to guarantee we have an upper bound for all of the terms in the sequence, we let u be the maximum between a i and a plus one. And for the lower bound, we let l be the minimum of a j and a minus one. 
Thus, we can say for every sing single index n, we have capital L less than or equal to a minus one, which is less than a n, less than a plus one, and less than or equal to capital U for all indices n bigger than capital N. And then for all the indices n less than or equal to capital N, we know we still have it bounded between L and U. L less than or equal to a n less than or equal to capital U. So for both cases, we have for every single index n, a n is bounded between L and U. Between L and U, pick m to be the maximum of the absolute values of a, or sorry, absolute values of U and absolute value of L. So therefore, the absolute value of a n is going to be less than or equal to m since we're using the maximum of the absolute values of our two bounds. So that means we sequence a n is bounded. I probably could have worded this a lot shorter, um, but I do think it helps to be descriptive to describe sort of, uh, to emphasize what's going on here. So now we've shown basically a convergent sequence it is uh, bounded. If it converges, it's bounded. And then we're also going to make use of the other bullet point. A sequence is bounded if and only if the absolute value of the terms are less than or equal to some value m. And that happens for all indices. All right, so now we're going to finally get to the proof. So we will now prove that the sequence of the product a n times b n is converges to the product of their limits a times b. All right, so for the strategy, um, and I didn't write everything out just so we can go through the thought process, but I wrote the first bit. So what we're trying to show in the end is that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N such that for all little n thicker than capital N, we have the product of a n times b n less than the product a b, or sorry, minus the product of a b less than epsilon. All right, that's what we're trying to show. Well, we know that the sequence a n converges to a and the sequence b n converges to b. So therefore, there's a corresponding epsilon values for each one of them to where you have the absolute values for each one being less than that particular epsilon value. So I'm using epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. And to do this, it's going to involve a clever trick. So this will involve a clever trick. if we want to make use of our two assumptions. All right, and that trick is basically adding a zero. We're going to add zero in a very clever way. All right, and I'm just going to go ahead and write it out. So, um, let's see, so this is what we are manipulating or what we need to uh, use. And I'm going to manipulate it in the following manner. And I'll be adding and subtracting um, a times b n. So I have a minus a times b n, and then plus a times b n, and then I have minus a b. All right, then I can do some rearranging, 
and for the rearranging, at least for here, I have Bn that I can factor. So this will equal to Bn parentheses and then An minus A. And then for this, I can factor out A. So that's going to be plus, and then that's going to be Bn minus b. By triangle inequality, this is going to be less than or equal to, so have bn times a n minus a plus the absolute value of a times bn minus b. Now we could separate this into the following. So this will be equal to the absolute value of Bn times the absolute value of An minus A, and then plus the absolute value of A times the absolute value of Bn minus B. All right, so all of this is equivalent to that, or um, well, less than or equal to um, the but yeah, so we want this entire thing to be less than epsilon. Now we can make use of some assumptions here. So we know we have that less than epsilon one. So we, we can, there's a way that we can manipulate epsilon one. We know that's gonna be less than epsilon one. And we know the BN part, that's gonna be less than epsilon two. So we're gonna choose our epsilon E1 and E2 in such a way that we'll get epsilon at the end when we take this entire sum. All right, and how do we do that? Well, from our, what we proved earlier, we know that um, if a sequence converges, it's bounded. So we know convergence implies bounded. The sequence BN converges. So the absolute value of Bn is less than or equal to some capital M. All right, so that's based on our assumption. Since Bn converges, we know it's bounded by some capital M, and that's for all N. So then this is going to be less than or equal to some capital M. And now A is a fixed value. So A is fixed. So we know this is fixed. So then our choice for E1 and E2, we're going to let if we let E1 be equal to epsilon divided by M, that will cancel out the other M from the BN being bounded. And let's see. yeah, we can do that because M is bigger than zero by what I was using for definition for bounded. Um, now for epsilon two, so 
similar thing, we would let that be equal to epsilon, but divided by absolute value of A. But A could be zero. So instead of just absolute value of A, use absolute value of A plus one because then we have absolute value of A or um, epsilon over the absolute value of A uh, A plus one is less than that And we know A itself, absolute value of A is less than absolute value of A plus one. Right. And again, this is all scratch work. So what I'm gonna have, let's see if this is gonna work or not. So we have BN times AN minus A. plus the absolute value of A times B and minus B. So we're saying this is uh, gonna be less than or equal to, so the BN is less than or equal to some, some N because it's bounded. So this is bounded. And then times some E1 and then plus absolute value of A times some E2. We know the absolute value of A is less than A plus one. So then this is all gonna be uh, less than M E1 plus the absolute value of A plus one times E2. We said E1 was E over M. So then this is gonna equal, all of this is gonna be M and then E over M then plus absolute value of A plus one. And then E2 was E over A plus one, right? We're doing the plus one. We're doing plus one instead of dividing by just uh, A because A is possibly could be zero. Now, what is that gonna give us? So what we'll get, the M's will divide out, this A plus one thing will divide out, but that gives us epsilon plus epsilon, right? So that's actually two epsilon. We need just epsilon. All right, so we can just do a slight modification. And the slight modification is to instead of divide by M here, I'll divide by two M. And then instead of dividing by absolute value A plus one, I'm dividing by two times that. So then that'll give us epsilon over two when you cancel that out and then plus another epsilon over two to give us epsilon. Okay, so let me try to summarize this all. All right, so again, we're trying to show this is less than some, is less than epsilon. 
well by doing some clever algebra. This is, uh, I said it was minus uh, a times b in and then plus a times b in because that's adding zero. Right, because that, that's adding that's adding zero. And then this is less than or equal to, and then here we have the bn, so that was bn times a n minus a plus, and then here we have a, so we factor out a, so it'd be plus a times b n minus b. All right, and we know B in, that's less than or equal to M because uh, B in converges, so it's bounded. So that's less than or equal to M, where M is bigger than zero. And then we use some value of epsilon. So this a n minus a is less than epsilon. And we're using epsilon one. And then we use b n minus b that converges. So we said that's less than some epsilon two. And then for epsilon one, we're gonna use epsilon divided by 2m. So I'll erase this and I'd say that's less than epsilon over 2m. Epsilon 2, remember we're using uh, epsilon and just like how we divided by 2, we divide by 2 here and I said try a but then we can't divide by zero so to be extra careful we did a plus one absolute value of a plus one all right and we know the absolute value of a is less than a absolute value of a plus one so then the entire thing We'll get this to be uh, less than m times epsilon over 2m. That takes care of the first part. And then plus absolute value of a plus 1. And then times epsilon over 2 times uh, 2 times absolute value of a plus 1. And then the m's divide each other out, so you get epsilon over 2. So this is epsilon over 2 plus another epsilon over 2. All right, that's how we're going to do the proof. All right, so I'm going to do the proof. And normally I've been doing the proofs in red, but since we've got a lot going on here, I'm going to use different colors so it's easier to sort of color coordinate things. Um, blue has been the common color I've been using to write stuff in, so that's what I'll use so for the proof. All right, so let's see. So we need to show This converges to A times B. Um, so given epsilon greater than zero, we know A in converges to A. So then that means there's, uh, let's see, so then For all 
epsilon one bigger than zero, there exists an n one such that for all n, little n bigger than n one. Uh, we have the absolute value of a n minus a less than epsilon one. So we know that's for every epsilon. Since this is the case, uh, find n one so that we have the absolute value of a n minus a less than and what we're going to use for epsilon one was e over or epsilon over q times n so let's say epsilon over two times m for m is bigger than zero Okay, so, and I'll use M as green. All right, so we know B and converges to B. So it's bounded. Say the absolute value of Bn is less than equal to the same capital M uh, for which we have from before. And then let's see what else. Also, since Bn converges to B. Uh, we have for all epsilon two greater than zero, there exists an N two such that um, for all n little n bigger than N two, then we have the absolute value of B N minus B less than epsilon over two. Mm -hmm or sorry, epsilon two. Mm -hmm. So since this is the case, um, find N two Where the apps where for all n bigger than n2, we have the absolute value of bn minus b less than um, epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of a plus 1. All right, what else can we do? All right, so I felt I got a little tripped up because I really should have done this part of the proof first. I should have stated this. before I talked about finding the N1.
before finding that N1 where the absolute value of AN minus A is less than epsilon over two times M. If I want to get really, real technical here, I should have done, a, I should have talked about this bounded part first. That way it would have made more sense for when I chose this particular N1. All right, so let's assume that I already said, so it would have been given epsilon bigger than zero. Since Bn converges, um, it's bounded. So say the absolute value of Bn is less than or equal to capital M for capital M is bigger than zero. All right, that should have been stated in that order. Then I should have said, well, we know a n converges, then for all epsilon one, there exists an n one, such that for all little n bigger than n one, we have the absolute value of a n minus a less than epsilon one. So since that's the case, that works for every epsilon one, we're gonna find a particular n one such that that difference of a n minus a is less than epsilon over two m, where m is the same value that we're using for the bound for uh, the sequence b n. All right, so I should have said it in that order. All right, um, then since b n converges to b, we have for all epsilon two, there exists an n two such that for all little n bigger than n two, b n minus b is less than less than epsilon two. So since that's the case, this works for any epsilon two, we're gonna find a particular N two where for all little n bigger than N two, we have Bn minus B absolute value of that less than epsilon divided by two times in parentheses absolute value of A plus one. All right, and that way we're both using the same epsilon at the beginning of the proof. So we're all using that in regards to that same epsilon. Okay, um, I will say maybe just note yeah, well, this is pretty obvious that uh, a absolute value of a is less than absolute value of a plus one. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the actual string of inequalities. Um, but first, I'm going to pick N, capital N, just like in proof before, uh, in the video before, where I picked the maximum of two N values. That's what I'm going to do here. So I want to pick the capital N to be the largest of N1 and N2. So that way, it's the index value that's going to guarantee the convergence of BN and AN. So you want to pick the larger index value in order to guarantee the convergence for the two sequences. Um, now I can go into it. So if we think we're all in any little n bigger than capital N, we have absolute value of uh, a n times b n minus a b equal to absolute value of a n b n uh, minus our a times b n plus a times b n by adding the zero. And then this whole thing is less than or equal to, and we could um, factor out the Bn's and have it so it's Bn absolute value of that times the absolute value of An minus A. And then plus, and then we factor out the A's, so the absolute value of A times the absolute value of Bn minus B. Okay, so we know um, Bn, that's less than or equal to M. So this is gonna be less than M times epsilon one plus, and we know absolute value of A 
that's less than the absolute value of a plus one. Uh, times E2. And now for E1 and E2, this is going to be capital M times epsilon over 2M plus absolute value of A plus 1. So two times absolute value of A plus one. All right, and that's what we're using for E1 and E2. All right, so we found the particular in indices corresponding to E1 and E2 so that we have E1 being the same equal to E over 2M and then E2 being equal to E over 2 times uh, parentheses apps value of A plus 1. Well, what is this all going to be? So this is going to be equal to, um, so we have the M's divide out. We have the A plus 1's divide out. So that's epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. And we've done it. And that's the proof, finally. <laughs> All right, so that's where I'll stop the video. And I mistakenly should have said uh, the bounded part first. <laughs>